Uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us today, either through the live um, event or through the recording. Your participation helps our Smith community stay strong. And we are so especially grateful to McKenna for sharing her talents in this very special place with us today. We had almost a thousand Smithies sign up to join us today. So that is just such a testament to how special Julia was and this place is for our Smith community. And I wanna say happy first day of spring. Um, it's a lovely day here in Western Massachusetts. So I hope you're enjoying your day as well. I'm just gonna start with a few uh, house, uh, housekeeping notes. Everyone who has joined today is muted to help limit background noise, but we really encourage you to ask your questions through the Q&A box or um, through the chat. We'll be monitoring it throughout. Um, and we will be recording the webinar today and it will soon be made available on the Smith College YouTube channel. So you can look for that. Uh, as I introduced McKenna and everyone's already doing this, but we love to see where you're joining us from today. So please feel free. And if you feel comfortable sharing with the 500 plus attendees, um, select panelists and attendees and that will um, share it with everybody who's joined. So uh, McKenna held class of 07 and Julia share a number of things in common. They are both incredibly tall, deeply passionate about French cooking, have a what the hell attitude in the kitchen and call Smith College their alma mater. A natural disruptor and never one to turn away from an entrepreneurial venture, McKenna bought La Peach sight unseen and moved her entire life to Provence, never having even visited the South of France. When she's not teaching unsuspecting cooks new levels of courageousness around the globe, she writes, uh, writes for and manages OK Perfect, a food and travel blog focused on exquisite and impartial journalism. She's also the CEO of the Art of Traction and Your Leadership Recipe, a coaching consultancy that works with corporate teams and leaders nonprofit leadership and entrepreneurs. She's a graduate of NYU's Global Affairs Program, studied philosophy at Smith, and mastered whipping up mousses, sauces, and the like at Le Cordon Bleu Paris. So thank you so much, McKenna. Um, we are so lucky and we're so grateful to have you here today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. Holy cow. Oh la vache. There is so, so many of you. It is such a joy to be here and I am so excited to dive in with you all and I'm so thankful for that whelm, whelm, welcome, warm welcome. <laughs> I'm McKenna, I'm an 07 grad and we are currently in the La Peach kitchen and today we are going to talk a little bit about the history of La Peach, we're going to talk a little bit about what I'm up to utilizing La Peach and if you bought your ingredients we're also going to cook a little thing. So. It is so, so great to see you all. And I am so excited to be sharing this magical space with you today. So the order of operations today, we are going to start our roasted salad. We're gonna do that a little, get that started and thrown in the oven. Then we're gonna take a little tour of the property. Uh, my lovely partner over here is going to be filming the tour for us while I talk and uh, then we'll have some Q&A and then we'll kind of put together the salad and finish with more Q&A. So that is what we're up to. Thanks for sharing where you all are from. I have seen so many states fly by. I can barely keep track with over 560 people here. It is so fun to be sharing this space with you today. So before we get into the history, today we are making something I've only made once before. And that's kind of how we roll here at the La Peach Kitchen and the Courageous Cooking School. Um, so here at the Courageous Cooking School, we run a recipe-free cooking school, and we are going to play with that today and kind of jump into the shallow end of recipe-free cooking. This is a salad I've never made exactly this way. It's a salad I've made before similarly, and I was thinking through what we could get seasonally in the U.S. and in Provence right now, trying to think about the potentiality for that. So for someone from Australia, who may not have had access to these ingredients as easily as us. You're on like the opposite side of the world. So um, that's where we're going to get started. So before we even dive in, if you're cooking with me, I need you to turn on your oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or about 200 degrees Celsius. That's first step first. I have already done that. So we are good on my end. If you are cooking with me, make sure you go do that right now. 
Uh, and while I'm letting everybody set up their ovens, I want to talk a little bit about the Courageous Cooking School. So I bought the peach in 2015 and closed in 2016 and opened the school, <coughs> pardon me, in 2016. And when I bought the peach, I had this really difficult quandary. And the quandary was whose recipes do I teach. And now everybody would say, oh, well, Julia's, right? And the reason why I didn't pick Julia's recipes was the Master of the Art of French Cooking was built for an American audience with an American kitchen and with an American ingredient set in a very certain time period that is not the current time period. And frankly, Julia did a really, really good job with her cookbooks. And so teaching you to cook like her via me felt like this really weird roundabout way to talk about cooking. And so when I was trying to conceptualize of the cooking school, I really had to kind of dive into, well, if I'm not going to teach Julia Child's recipes and I'm not going to teach Simone Beck's recipes, um, we'll talk about more in a little bit, I'm kind, and I'm not going to teach my recipes because who's to say that I'm any better than anyone else. I really had to figure out a new way to teach cooking uh, that worked with the property. So I kind of sat with this notion of was recipe free teaching even really possible? As someone who had gone to culinary classes and was planning to go to culinary school and had friends who had gone to culinary school and had seen how recipe heavy it was, it felt at the time very dubious. And this was long before the New York Times was doing their recipe free recipes. And there was kind of this move towards breaking up away from the cookbook. And it was at a time where I had to figure out how I could fit my own approach to cooking into a property that has a lot of historical value and a lot of historical interest and a lot of historical obsession and joy and cooking joie de vivre already built into it. So we decided to go completely recipe free. So that's kind of what we're going to play with a little bit today. And if you are a uh, cookbook codependent, it's totally fine. Welcome. It's okay. I have been there too. And there is a lot of things that we do at the Courageous Cooking School that are a little bit different. And so today what we're going to do is we are going to make a roasted fennel and roasted citrus. I picked grapefruit. I also have some blood oranges because I found them today and that will work great too. And what we're going to construct is a really simple but bright and beautiful and exciting salad. So the first thing we need to do is prepare our fennel and our citrus to go get roasty toasty in that oven that you just created. So I behind me have some fennel, which I already chopped a couple slices off of so I can show you how beautiful it is. And if you think you hate fennel, try it roasted. Trust me on that. I really hate anisette flavors. So I despise licorice. I don't like fennel particularly raw, but I find roasted fennel to be like this bright, exciting, crunchy vegetable that actually like brings some joy back to a vegetable that I dislike really strongly. Uh, truly, like it's just not my thing. And I recently did a cooking class with the online school about two months ago in like the deep winter when fennel was popping off here. And we did fennel four ways and everybody in the school was like, I love fennel. I'm like, I don't, but here we go. So I, this was the last time I cooked something very similar to this. So what we're gonna do first, is we're gonna take our fennel and you're going to pop it on a chopping board and I will adjust my view in just a second. And we are going to slice it like so. So I'm going to take off these pretty fronds in my specific directions. I said, if you could find something with pretty fronds, that is preferable. In France, you really can't find fennel with like the really long, beautiful fronds, which always breaks my heart. It's one of the things I'm always really excited about going back to the States. I usually joke and say that all I miss is Mexican food and Taco Bell. And they're not the same, to be clear. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that I also miss certain things about vegetables, like fennels has these beautiful fronds in here. That's about as beautiful as you get. So I'm going to chop the fronds off and set them aside. I'm going to put it on its end, and it's got a kind of a longer end and a squattier end, and I am going to slice long ways. So why am I going to slice long ways? This is why I pre-slice. Look at how pretty it is. We're going to look for that beautifulness. If you slice once, like I already have, and you see that there's a big core, so this is the core right here, the part that goes in the ground and the roots come from it. If it's bigger than that, and even at this, I'm gonna kind of trim it out. So you'll wanna make sure you do that. So I'm just gonna kind of cut a V into it so I get most of it out. You can see what I've removed, see what I have left. And I'm gonna give this a nice uh, quarter inch to half an inch, half an inch is a little wide, 
quarter inch slices. I got a couple extra frondy bits there that I'm going to pull out. And I'm going to go ahead and put that on a nice sheet tray. And I'm going to save the end. I don't particularly like the side, I guess the cheek sides of it, so that I can use that in another way or not later. I might put it in a stock, that stock class on Sunday. I might put it in a stock. I'm going to do it again with another one. Make sure it fits in the other thing. Um, chop off the tops again. I'm going to save those because it's what I'm going to use to dress my salad and make it pretty. So I'm going to put those aside. I'm going to check this one. This one's pretty uh, rough. What I mean by that is I can tell that that first layer is pretty thick. So I'm going to kind of peel that first layer off and just kind of put it aside. I may shave some on the fresh salad or the roasted salad when I'm done to get a little bit of that fresh flavor. I prefer that. That feels a little bit more accessible for especially my palate that doesn't love, love fennel. I'm just going to keep slicing those beautiful fennels at a, at a quarter inch top to bottom. Oh, I didn't take out the core. I should have. Look at how much bigger the core is on this one. That was a miss. So I'm going to pop that out of the rest. I'm going to check mine. I have one that's fine and one that needs some help. You see that? I'm just going to pop that on out. And I'm going to put this on two sheet trays because I am feeding a crew of five this evening. Four, not five. I've miscounted. The four of us this evening. Um, it's not just me. You'll see some of the rest of them later. We are on our next lockdown. So we are locked down once again with our staff. So much fun. Ah, oh, the COVID times. So there's a couple more slices. We miss having guests, in case you're wondering. If that was going to be one of your questions, I have answered it for you. Yes, we miss having guests. I haven't had a guest since last summer, but none of our scheduled guests were with us because they were all Americans and haven't been able to travel. So I'm just going to cut through two fennels. I could do three. I bought Three, but I'm just going to do these two. They're pretty nicely sized. And then I'm also going to grab my citrus. So I said grapefruit, right? That was my recommendation. That's the thing that is very much in season right now for most people. I also found some beautiful blood oranges from Italy today. So what we're looking for in our citrus is we're looking to cut it. You want to find the place where the stem attaches and then the little kind of butt end for lack of a better word. And you want to slice it that way. So you've got one end, the stem end here and the butt end here, and you want to slice it that way. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to do a little bit of grapefruit. I'm going to do a little bit of orange. So before you start going, yes, I did wash my fruit, but actually, I don't know if I did. It, it, it came from a place that pre-washes everything and it's organic. So I'm not freaking out about it, but yeah, I'd wash it. We're going to keep the peel on. So yeah. So I'm going to start by checking my grapefruit first because my grapefruit sometimes has too big of a skin to be very tasty. Exactly. Um, just sliced. So this is what I was going to say. You see all this pith? Pith is bitter. Pith isn't very pleasant at this amount. You can totally just slice fruit in rounds and roast it. But with this much pith, I don't want to. So I'm going to take off the other end so I get a flat surface. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off most, if not all of this. What I have just done is created a flat surface on the top, a flat surface on the bottom. I'm going to take my knife and put it at an angle into that pith and try to go around the fruit without taking too much fruit off to round off that skin. I took off too much fruit, but you can do better than me or do the exact same as me. But I am now that I have one off, I can actually see the fruit, right? So I can actually get a more accurate, oh, yes, so much better and rounding around it. And I'm gonna put that aside. So I'm just pulling off that pith, which wouldn't be very pleasant roasted. Again, if it didn't have much pith, it would be totally fine. If your grapefruit looks more like my blood orange, you're fine. Also, that is not a very blood orangey orange, but 
So I wouldn't worry about that, but I would worry about kind of almost double that. Also grapefruit pith is a little bit more bitter than say orange pith. And also this really comes down to your tolerance for bitter. My delightful partner who is going to be filming the tour while I explain it in a minute, he uh, hates grapefruit. Yeah, that's accurate. Hates grapefruit. So I avoid anything that is too grapefruity about grapefruit, which the pith and the skin are going to be even more strongly grapefruity than just the kind of segments themselves. So what I've done is then sliced into them still. I have a little bit extra pith I can remove. And I'm gonna take those lovely rounds and put them on my tray. I will show you my tray when I'm done, I promise. Okay, I'm checking the comments too to see if anybody has any questions. And also those of you who, the, my, my fellow Smithy moderators, could you make sure if there's any like serious cooking questions to ask them from me? Cause I can't follow how fast the comments are moving. So Absolutely. Let me know. <laughs> I, um, we do have a question that came in from Virginia. Uh, mm -hmm. Should fennel be in a single layer on the baking sheet or is overlap okay? You know, so here's the thing. Technically it should be on a single layer, but the cool thing about double layer, oh, I found some blood orange color in my orange finally. Uh, the thing about double layering is, is you're going to get some that gets less roasted. So if you love the flavor of fennel, that can actually be a strategy. If you strongly dislike the, the flavor or are eh about the flavor of fennel, I would definitely not do that. So what happens when you overlap it is you're going to get sections of it that aren't going to roast as effectively as the other ones, which means you're not going to get that kind of like sweet roasted fennel vibe. But if you want a little bit of raw fennel vibe, then more power to you. Let them overlap. Otherwise, <laughs> I kind of keep them separate. Yeah. Um, how about any reason not to hand peel versus using a knife? Yes, because it leaves more pith and it's not as pretty. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, that's really it. Like, and there's not a really good reason. Also, sometimes hand peeling uh, creates a travesty. <laughs> you like your hand peeling and then the whole thing starts to fall apart, right? Um, and it's not holding together as well as you thought. This guarantees you get these nice, beautiful little rounds, which makes plating your salad more effective and beautiful. But there's not technically anything wrong with peeling it off. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. So have, this is what my tray looks like right now. Beautiful. Somebody asked about um, the size of your roasting sheet. Uh, do you put whatever fits in your oven? Tray? I'm doing two. Yeah. I mean, I would go with the biggest that fits in your oven. You can see our lovely oven sunflower here. We've got two ovens. They're small. Um, oh, I, I started the static oven. That's a terrible idea. Uh, we also have two different types of ovens. So I just turned mine. My static oven is very slow to cook. So I just switched to my convection oven. It's really not important, the size. It really depends on how much room you want to have. This is about as big as that fits in my oven. There's no rule. It won't cook any differently based on the size of the tray. Okay. There's a few questions about uh, nonstick, greased, parchment paper. Do you use any of that? You know, Aluminum foil, parchment paper, nonstick, all of it's fine. I'm not super worried about it. If you notice, my trays are on the older side. Um, it's going to roast and leave some bits behind, uh, but I'm going to scrub it when I'm done. I'm not going to be panicky about it. It will get kind of roasted. So if that's going to make you nervous and you don't want to have to clean up yet, yeah, take your stuff off and then foil the trays. I try to avoid cooking with foil as much as possible. But oh, there we go. I got some blood orange finally. Someone, uh, we have a couple of questions about knife recommendations too. Oh, cool. I'm happy to talk about knives. I am a coll avid collector of knives. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, I have one that's not as pretty. I don't care. Yeah. It's the right color. It's just not the right size. I was excited about knives and then made a bad knife cut. <laughs> Ironic. Um, so my favorite affordable knife is the made in chef's knife. It's one word made in as in made in France or made in the US. And it's made in cookware and they sell an amazing chef knife, chef's knife that is made in France. It's I think somewhere between 75 and $85 and you can get it engraved with your name, which I think is fun too. Um, and it's my favorite at that price point. Um, what you really need is a chef's knife, just one good eight inch plus chef's knife with a handle that you like in your hand. 
It doesn't have to be the perfect handle. It has to feel good in your hand. If it doesn't feel good in your hand, you will not like it. So this is my actually my uh, chef at the cooking school's knife. She's in the U.S. right now. She's the she's the executive chef, and I, I'm the entertainer and co-chef. And I don't love her knife. She loves it. But I didn't bring my knives. Um, they need to be sharpened, and we're on lockdown, so I don't feel like sharpening them myself right now. So that's my favorite at a lower end cost, and really whatever it comes down to. I also really love like Japanese knives, which you can buy a lot of those at places like uh, I guess Sir La Table doesn't exist anymore; they went bankrupt. But William Sonoma carries them. I don't recommend buying from William Sonoma, but you can go find a brand you like there. They'll let you try the knives, and then you can figure out which one you like. But you can spend. Uh, $25 on a chef knife. You can get a global chef's knife, which is what Anthony Bourdain always recommends. Again, I don't like the way the handles feel. They don't have a kind of like pulled together handle. They're just all metal and they have like nubbies on them, They're like little plastic nubbins. And I hate that, um, but that's a really great chef's knife. And um, you can spend all the way up to 475 plus dollars on a chef's knife or you can be like me and make a sojourn solely while you're pregnant to Corsica to hike up the side of a mountain to buy a chef's knife with a horn handle. <laughs> you can do that too. That's great. Um, ceramic knives are great. I find them harder to take care of. I prefer carbon steel. They do get color on them and they do tint the color of your uh, onions but that's my favorite or just stainless steel. Um, ceramic knives are fine though too. Can you remind us of the oven temperature, McKenna? 200 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Let me make sure I did my conversion correctly. I did. That's where they're at halves. I was like, oh no, please. Converting uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit is still like the bane of my existence because I still think in Fahrenheit. Okay, so I've got some citrus. I've got some fennel. We have a I probably have more here. citrus than fennel. That tracks since I don't love fennel that much, right? And I'm using my very fancy box of olive oil today because <laughs> uh, I bought it and I haven't had time to, time to decant it yet. So I'm just going to give this a good oiling and how much enough to coat my vegetables. Please don't ask me to measure it. I didn't. I won't. It depends on how much salad you're making. That's one of the things about, you know, thinking about recipe three. It's like, what's the purpose of the olive oil? The purpose of the olive oil is to protect the vegetable from burning give it something to brown in and add flavors. I am going to make sure all of my fruit is well coated. All of my fennel is well coated. And that is the purpose. So I mentioned in the ingredient list that you should bring your spice cabinet. Let's talk a little bit about how you could spice this if you so felt like. So I'm just literally, you can see, I'm just kind of running my veggies and my fruit into this olive oil, making sure that, giving them a flip to make sure they all have a little bit of olive oil there. Might add a little bit more to that tray because I'm running thin on the back half. When someone asks me about how much the measurement should be, I say, I often say a floop or a sloosh <laughs> or a floopity boop. I mean, like literally, um, I, I gave up on using recipes a long time ago because I found recipes to not match with my ADHD, to be honest. I couldn't keep track of it. It just didn't work for me. I would get lost. I end up talking to a friend and I'm burning my onions because I'm like three minutes and it's, you know, been seven. Yeah. So that I just try to make sure I'm paying attention. So let's talk about how I could flavor this, right? Now, I want you to think we're roasting at a relatively high temperature, so dried herbs are not going to exactly thrive in a hot oven. Um, some spices will do just fine, but in general, what I'm going to recommend with this is salt it and flavor it later. Um, if you really want to add a flavor now and you're excited, the only thing I might put on this right now would be... I mean, you could put turmeric on this and that would be delicious. Honestly, you could like coat this in turmeric and make it really yellow and fun and add that kind of earthiness that is turmeric. Um, and if you're asking how I'm salting, I'm just adding uh, some salt to make sure that everything has a little bit of salt on it. It helps to dry it out a little bit. It helps to bring out some of the liquid of the fennel and it'll help it really brown and caramelize nicely. Um, 
What I'm going to do when this is finished is season it. I'm not going to season it now. I might season the dressing. I worry about my oven burning spices. It does it all the time. So that is what I am worried about. So I'm just salting. I'm not peppering because I'm worried about the pepper burning. And I'm going to toss this right into the oven. And it's going to sit there for 30 to 40 minutes. You're going to have to check it at about 20. And all the questions about the house and Julia, if you could just hold them until we start talking about that piece, I am going to talk about that for over an hour. And then if I miss one, Excellent. I'll make sure. Okay, well, yeah. If I miss something you asked, I'll make sure I circle back to it. So I'm gonna toss these into my oven. Um, for proof of how bad my static oven is, I'm going to put one in the static oven to show the differences about, this will explain why we're recipe free. And it'll show you very, very clearly why. So I'm gonna put one in my convection. It's noisy. <laughs> You'll notice the other one is not noisy, but silent. That's because it doesn't have a fan in the background. So I'm gonna put one in each, and we are gonna see how that goes. Excellent. So there were some questions about olive oil, um, extra virgin. Is there a reason to decant olive oil? Oh my God. There's so many things about olive oil. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about olive oil since we make olive oil on the property and then let's go on the tour because we're losing light. Um, yeah. So actually let's go on the tour and then let's talk about olive oil. We'll, we'll kind of talk about that. Let's talk about the kitchen a little bit, and then I'm going to send my delightful partner out into the garden, and he's going to do a tour uh, where they will pin him and his video. We are going to dive into the kitchen um, first and talk a little bit about the kitchen, and then we'll come back to the kitchen and talk more about the kitchen. So first of all, what I am standing in is essentially the original kitchen. Um, the only thing that has changed is that the wall colors have been repainted. And the pegboard has been repainted and I'll show you how. It's very funny because it's been painstakingly restored, um, not by me, but by the previous owner. So this is literally the same layout that it's been for decades now. And um, it was built on the back side of the house, which makes it very, very dark. We have stage lights. I'll show you that in a second too. Because back in the 60s and 70s, of course, there was no AC. In fact, there wasn't AC till we bought the house. And so this meant that it got zero Southern exposure. So the kitchen was one of the few places that even in the heat of summer, you could maybe cook, right? So it was on the back side of the house. And it was really built to be super functional, obviously. It was built uh, very similarly to the Cambridge kitchen. And uh, it was treated as an eat-in kitchen. It would have been very small as a kitchen, but they did eat inside of it. Um, and so the pegboard has been synonymous with Julia Child. Paul Child was the one who came up with it. He came up with it because Julia's favorite cooking store in Paris has had it since the 1800s, the pegboard on the walls that shows the pots and pans. It's called Eat the Hillerin in Paris. It is on the right bank next to a really great restaurant called Pie au Cochon. It's one of my favorite places in Paris. And so the kitchen has been kind of kept as close as you can um, to the original. A lot of the things in the kitchen are original. A lot of them aren't, right? Like that's just the case. And um, the things that are original, uh, we don't actually tell you what's original and what's not uh, due to theft issues we had early on on the property. So now we just kind of like, if you wanna do your research, you can. Um, but we have a ton of things that have been around for a really long time. We also have new pots and pans that we've added. So I'm going to take a little quick walk um, and show you kind of what I mean by. So it used to be the same baby blue that was in the Cambridge kitchen. And now it's been painted a light yellow. And you can see the original marking. And you can see how the second owner of the house, Kathy Alex, um, went right by it. And like just kind of missed the mark. And you can see, I'm not sure how well you can see, but there's like the old baby blue kind of back in the pegboard holes. And so um, one of the things I will tell you is 100% original is this gigantic wooden spoon. Let's see, I've got to avoid the theater lights we have. But this gigantic wooden spoon up here, Julia loves to put it in the olive tree that was on the main terrace that you'll see in a minute and uh, take photos with it. It's like a bunch of her photo shoots. It's this huge spoon with like a, a chain on it. And I don't actually know the history of the spoon. We've tried to figure that out and we've never been able to. Um, nice. So now we're gonna head outdoors. 
And so we're going to move through the garden. Bim Dang is obviously the basically what used to be considered the main entrance to the house, which was the kitchen back door. And you are literally looking in at me. That's so strange. Hello, myself. And um, now we're looking at the upper terraces and the rosemary that's all behind the house. And we are just at about 20 to 30 minutes until sunset. So it's quite a nice time to be out in the garden. So we're in early, early, early first day of spring. And what you're looking at now is the Cabanon, which is one of the original properties on Domaine de Bramfam, which is where Le Peach exists and lives. Domaine de Bramfam was the uh, land that Simone Beck's family purchased after World War II. And that Cabanon has been around since before the Napoleonic maps. It is, was considered the old shepherd cabin. And it was where uh, Paul's office and wine cellar was. So you're just kind of taking a look in the Jardin just next to it. Um, and the Cabanon is where I lived for the first two years living on the property. And um, I now no longer live there. And now one of our staff lives there. So as we're moving into the terraces, what you're seeing is the main olive grove that's been around for a very long time. Those olive trees have been around forever. Brahma fam means to cry from hunger. So this area of Provence was not well known for its food. And now here we are growing food. Do you notice it's in raised beds? That is because we are on the terrain of Bramofam to cry from hunger. And the reason why it was called that is because this area is full of clay soil. You cannot plant anything in it. So we've had to create raised beds and they're kind of dormant right now. And uh, awesome. So Bramofam meant to cry from hunger. And which is funny now because there's been no crying from hunger here for a very long time. But all that was grown on here was sheep, and uh, you can't grow cows because of the terrain. Uh, you can't raise cows, grow cows. You don't grow cows, you don't plant them. Uh, you can't raise cows. And now, and you could raise, uh, you could grow olives and you could do that sort of stuff, but the food access was pretty low. And now what we've been able to do is thanks to modern technology, we've been able to um, grow a bunch of citrus and some other fruit trees, but it takes a lot, a lot of fertilizer. So now we're walking up into the top of the terraces. What you see behind the kind of at the end of the terraces is some very large trees. We have about another quarter acre that we won't be walking into. It is land we cannot touch. It's called Le Sauvage. And it is like the land we're not allowed to touch. It's the open space and the rest we're allowed to cultivate and play with. The rest we kind of just have to let it do its thing. So as he's kind of moving that way, we're gonna pan over to the left. And what you'll be looking at is the old cistern that fed water to both Brahma Fam, which is the main property. And Chris, when you walk back down, can you try to get a good, the best view you can of Brahma Fam from over here? And that was the water source for the original moss that Simone Beck owned and took care of. And now we really, really want to make it into a duck pond, but our neighbor won't let us. And the reason why, if you notice, there is a stainless steel ladder is Simone Beck used to swim in her water source. True story. So Chris will descend back into the terraces and uh, we harvest our own olives. So all these olive trees every October-ish, November, um, we harvest the olives and take them to our local press. And now you can see this amazing view from the top kind of looking down onto the peach and our olive grove. And to the left is the town of Place Cassier. If we can pan that way a little bit, my love. Um, you can kind of see it in the distance. Place Cassier is where Julia used to get all of her provisions um, other than going to the main markets. These days, Place Cassier isn't exactly a village vivant is what it's called, like a living village. It's more of a village that's just there. People live there, but there aren't a lot of things happening there. There's one restaurant, a tobacco, a school, but it's missing like boulangeries and all of that to kind of create a living village. The closest living village to us is a village called Valbun, which is about six minutes away by car. So now we're looking at the back of La Peach. The windows on the right are the living room. The two little windows in the middle are the kitchen where I'm sitting. And um, you can also see the cabin. And then to the right, which you can't really see through the trees, uh, there is grass, which is the biggest 
town that's near us that's actually quite popular because it is the one of the capitals of perfumery in the world. So as Chris descends, um, we'll try to get a peek at Bramafam. There's some more of our, that's our lemon tree. She's doing well this year. Oh, almost ready. He's trying to see, he's like, is there a lemon ready? Let's see. There isn't right now. And that's our almond tree that he just panned past. And we have terraces full of herbs de Provence as we're working on starting our own line of herbs de Provence. That's the almond. And there's Bramafam. There you go. That is the back end of Bramafam. That was where the moss was that Simone Beck and her family lived in. So when Mastering the Art of French Cooking number one was being written and edited, Julia and Simone spent a lot of time in this house together. And let's just say it was un peu juste is how you would say it in French, which when you're wearing an item of clothing, that means it's a little tight and it's not for you. And when two people who are big personalities who are working together and who are dear friends and also colleagues, uh, it was just a little tight. And so Simone Beck recommended to Julia, uh, why don't you build a house on my land? I'll give you the land and uh, you can build a house. So in post-World War II France, owning a piece of property as an American was basically impossible, but building a property on someone else's land with a lease agreement, totally possible. So Paul and Julia decided to build La Peach so that they could spend a lot of time in this area that they had learned to love during all the time they spent with Simone's family um, on Bramafam and built La Pichoune. So now we're going to scooter poof around. This is kind of back towards the back of the kitchen. And then Chris will pass me and show you the back storage room, which is oh so interesting. There's the kitchen again and me talking on a computer. And right now our rosemary's in bloom. And we will show you now the terraces in the outdoor kitchen and our chickens and all of that jazz. Um, how many people are employed there? So we have myself, my husband, uh, Ian, who's our like full-time on staff. We have a chef who is full-time during season, part-time off season. And we work on some other food projects together. Um, so that, and then we have three other on staff in the United States. So now we're on the main terrace. That is the olive uh, tree that Paul planted and painstakingly took care of. And now it is doing quite well, as you can see. It's one of our favorite trees. And that is the pool um, that you're looking at now. The pool was installed by the first person to buy the house after Julia passed it back to Simone Beck. Kathy Alex was her name. She ran a cute little cooking school here called Cooking with Friends for a very, very long time. And she sold the property in 2015. Now we'll scoot on over to the outdoor kitchen. We built this just post first lockdown. So we have this lovely kitchen that all of the things have been uh, reclaimed from a 15th century abbey. So there we've got dinner being made. That is a spatchcock chicken on our Tuscan grill. We've got a normal gas grill, which isn't all that interesting to look at. And we've also have a very traditional pizza grill and you know, a nice little sink. And all of that stonework you're seeing, uh, the tiles, et cetera, are all reclaimed from an abbey. Now we'll take you up to the fire pit in the chickens. And then we'll go into the house. And then I will try to answer a lot of these questions about how I bought the house and all of that. So this is another thing we installed during the post first lockdown. We built this in-ground fire pit. Um, it is delightful. We have these stones uh, to walk on or sit on and then this kind of higher place to sit right there. And it's a really nice place because you get to really get a nice view of the property. And, you know, it's kind of in this like quiet little corner. Now we'll take you to meet the girls. The other thing we did during lockdown is we decided to get chickens. Um, we have four hens right now. And they are a little traumatized. We had more when one got attacked while we were off campus. Um, and it's been rough for the ladies. Um, so there's some chickens in there somewhere. Chris is gonna look for them. We've got four, uh, one white one, one black one and two brown ladies. There they are. Hello ladies. 
They produce brown, brown eggs, really dark brown eggs, and blue eggs. We have no white layers. Okay, so now let's come on back to take a look-see at the rooms and we'll call the tour complete. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the history. McKenna, while you're checking the oven, someone has asked if the convection oven is also set for 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. yes. Yep. So this, this is the yellow room. This was originally Paul's room. Um, we won't be able to show you Julia's room. It's currently storage. My apologies. Uh, but Paul and Julia did not sleep in the same room. Uh, rumor has it that one or both of them snored and they liked to blame the other. So this is kind of, this room has not changed at all since the uh, creation of the house. It was the only bedroom with a full bathroom for a very long time. So uh, this has kind of been how it's been. Some, there's been some tiling upgrades, but the layout hasn't changed at all. So there you go. That's the yellow room is what we call it. Then we'll go down the hallway. To the right is Julia's room. It's changed dramatically these days, so it doesn't look the same at all. It used to just be a large bedroom, and now it's a bathroom and a small bedroom. And then to the left is the blue room, which is the room where MFK Fisher used to stay and James Beard used to stay. Um, and it also has changed a little bit because we've added, well, we did not add, the previous owner, Alex, added a bathroom as well, which is right over there. Okay, and now Chris will kind of go into the living room a little. The kitchen is right there where he's pointing. There's the living room. There's me in the kitchen. And that is the whole house. So Chris, you can wave goodbye and we'll switch on to me. You can sign out. So the house was built in the 1960s by Paul and Julia. And it was never owned by them, as I said, but it was done on this kind of like handshake deal with Simone and it was built on friendship. And she gave it back to the Beck family once Simone and Paul had passed. She said there was no reason for her to continue coming here. And then Kathy Alex, who was a protege of Simone Beck's, purchased the house and started her own cooking school called Cooking with Friends. And in 2015, the house went on the market for the first time, like literally on the market publicly. And it was showcased in an article called The House That Julia Built in the New York Times on November 13th, 2015. And two things happened that day other than this house going viral. And yes, you should check your fennel and grapefruit. You want it to look kind of brown, but not burned. You want it to get roasty and nice, but you don't want it to be like charred. Um, and the house was already sold, strangely enough. It was sold through kind of the grapevine. Kathy Alex had made an exclusive deal with the New York Times to showcase it. So it actually had gone on the market earlier that week. And by the time that the article came out, the house was already sold. And I made a phone call to the real estate agent to find that out. And also had sent an email to every food and wine investor I knew, and, which was a very small number, it was about seven. And I just said, wouldn't it be cool to own Julia Child's house and sent them the link. And I had found out about it because of the Smith alumni forum on Facebook. And the house was already sold, but an interesting thing happened. A terrible, interesting thing happened. Just strange that it was the same day. It was the same day was the Bataclan attacks in Paris. So the, shoot, the mass shooting was the exact same day. And I had sent that email, popped in my car. I was living in the mountains of Colorado and I had descended down to go visit my family and like heard that on NPR. And I had this sinking gut feeling worried about, I had a lot of friends living in Paris. That was gut feeling number one. Gut feeling number two was, I bet that means the house will come back on the market because it was purchased by an American. And lo and behold, it did. It was back on the market by Monday. And by Thursday of the following week, we were on a phone call with the uh, real estate agent and a mortgage broker. And by the following, that was on Thanksgiving. And by the following Thursday, we had an accepted offer. Um, and in the process, a lot, a lot of us are trying to buy it too. We actually had a few people offer to buy it, buy our contract from us for a larger sum. And we decided to not accept it and buy it ourselves. So that's kind of how I ended up with the house. Uh, there's a lot more to the story, but I keep some of that under wraps because I got a book coming out. I want you to come visit. Um, I'm actually writing a cookbook. I have an agent who's also a Smithy who is probably in this video right now. Uh, my cookbook agent is also a Smithy. And so I'm keeping some of that under wraps so that you want to buy the book. 
uh, that tells the whole story that includes my grandmother and all of these like really kind of rich, fun details. Um, so that's the basic of the information about the house, the history, all that jazz. I'm gonna check my grapefruit and fennel one more time. Um, if you have any other questions, we can start answering questions specifically about the house, not about cooking. Um, so any questions you have about how I bought the house, how I made the decisions, all of that, I'm happy to answer those right now. Um, McKenna, so, we have a question about, um, uh, can, if, wondering if you can do whatever you want with the property or is it landmarked, so to speak? It's not landmarked, it's not old enough, and the French do not care about Julia Child. Other than her Medal of Honor, the French don't know she exists. It's very weird. That is so weird. Uh, okay. it was a so in question. French history, she doesn't, like the house is too young. Considering, so like the house I live in, in the town of Balbun, it was built in 1620. This was built in the 1960s. It just doesn't have the, like it, the historical value doesn't exist yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's another question that came in. Um, how do you, how did you amend the clay soil? asking for my own raised garden bed. I literally carted in organic soil. Mm -hmm. like we, it, none of it is, we have double dug, we have another section of the garden that you didn't see much of that we double dug uh, six seasons now and it hasn't gotten better. So we just decided to plop raised beds with uh, weed paper and bring in soil. Right. Someone has asked why your neighbor won't allow you to fill the cistern. Oh, because it's hers. <laughs> like it's her land. It's, it's not mine. And she doesn't want ducks. She already has a donkey and a horse. Like she, she, she doesn't want ducks on the property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, want <laughs> ducks. I want duck eggs. I'm like, right. <laughs> There's a question about um, you living there full time, which I know you kind of just spoke to. And then um, Virginia also asked, is it possible to visit? Yeah, it's totally possible to visit. Uh, so we do kind of higher end, mostly inclusive rentals during the summer months that include uh, meals by myself and the co-chef um, or another one of our friends in the local area who's a really exquisite chef. Uh, and then we do just like use the house as you'd like during the winter. And then we have the cooking school, which is fully all inclusive, immersive, five nights, six days. And that is kind of in the spring fall. Um, and so that's just at lapeach.com if you want information on that. This is not a sales pitch. So I don't want it to be like, turn into that, but I'll send the, there's the website if you want to take a look at us. Thanks. So. How do you manage, how did you manage to move to France as an American? It's really easy. Uh, if you look up visas in France, you have to have a kind of proof of base income for a year and they'll give you a visa. Great. It's super duper simple. Uh, it's not so simple to stay super long-term, but it's also not that complex. You just have to apply for a visa every year to four years, depending on the type of visa you have. Someone is asking, uh, McKenna, if you keep bees, this is actually coming from a beekeeper. We do. You have a we do not that. keep bees yet. Uh, it's on the list, but also my husband is deathly allergic to bees. Oh, yes. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, you got to be aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I just saw a question in the comments. Julia did not grow anything on the property at all. Her, her garden, she didn't even have a garden. Like it was olive trees and alfalfa. That was it. There was very limited anything else. There was a few ivies and a few roses, but it was meant to be turnkey, easy, low maintenance. So, I mean, the previous owner put in most of the garden and we have done tons. Um, she wasn't here long enough to grow her. She only came for five weeks at a time. She had rosemary and that sort of thing, but Really in France, you don't have to grow your own herbs. We do because we're a cooking school, but you can go to the market and get a bundle of herbs of every type of herb you can possibly imagine. And these days the prices is only a Euro a bundle. So imagine in the 1960s, it would have been pennies. Mm -hmm. Did you um, did you spend junior year abroad when you were a Smith student, McKenna? I did not, nope. Well, I mean, I kind of did. I dropped out of Smith for a year and moved to Cambodia. 
So if that counts, I took enough classes during my first uh, three years that I was able to get ahead by a full semester. And so I dropped out for a while and moved to Cambodia, but I did not do a Smith abroad program. Um, we actually have a question that will transition us probably back to some cooking. Um, were you a chef before you brought, bought the property? Can you talk a little bit about your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the answer is no, uh, but I was an avid cook. I spent a fair amount of time cooking for others and cooking food. Going into the food industry was so unappealing to me for so long because I grew up with my father being in the like corporate food industry. My dad was one of the kind of head of Taco Bell's, main, Taco Bell of all things, yep, main growth in the States during the late eighties, early nineties. And so he's the guy who invented fire sauce. He's the reason why there are so many of the dishes that you currently see on the menu. And he talked about how, even at that level, the industry was really, really, really challenging. <laughs> and so I kind of always like looked at the food industry as like, maybe not for me. And um, I also watched my family basically almost go bankrupt over owning restaurants too. Cause my father later went on to franchise restaurants and it just wasn't sustainable. It was a great brand. It just wasn't the right place, right time. And uh, so it was never really all that appealing to me. And so I kind of just kept my food stuff on the side. I was actually a uh, corporate project manager and corporate marketer for financial companies originally. So, yeah. Okay. Here's a question from Audrey. Um, Audrey asks, how all has living in France and in Julia's house changed your cooking style? Really good question. The answer is dramatically. Um, so I went to the Cordon Bleu and that taught me exactly how not to cook. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the thing about a school like the Cordon Bleu is that uh, the Cordon Bleu, whoever is the head chef at the time dictates the recipes. In the period of time I was there, the head chef, his recipes just didn't resonate with me or most of the students at the time. He's no longer the head chef there, by the way. And so I wouldn't know if it's worth going anymore. When I went, it was not. The education is built on the recipes and if the recipes are mediocre and don't taste very good, then your education becomes mediocre and doesn't taste very good. Um, so I learned a lot about how not to cook, but also a lot of technical skills that translate to how I cook now. Um, I have access to a very different array of ingredients now than I used to. Um, but I think that most of my cooking was driven by my time at Smith and my time living in New York City more than even here. So when I was at Smith, the dining system was in a complete overhaul and we were losing a lot of the house dining. I was kind of one of the people who was leading the kind of protests against that. And once one of the dining shifts happened, I was a junior. I still had a eat meal plan, but I was living in the French house Dawes, which had a decent kitchen, not great, but decent. And I, at the time, Hampshire College had a food share and it was before recipes were widely available online. And I signed up for their fall food share for $225. I like saved my summer babysitting money and internship money and bought a food share and started cooking for my friends. And between that and then moving to New York and having a CSA long again, kind of right as recipes were starting to make their way online, it was still at a time where recipes were fiercely guarded by the print publications in food world. And you wouldn't see recipes from magazines being online. And so I learned how to cook with all these ingredients I had never heard before. And that was kind of more influential for my early cooking and then moving to France and kind of understanding what I have access to here informed it a lot too. Um, I think that answers the question. <laughs> Uh, back so I had a question, what's the best way to get to La Peach if you wanted, if like you're planning a visit, you fly to the Nice airport, it's 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take a train, but you can also fly to Nice. So mm -hmm. that's super easy. Oh, another question about the sunflower. Is it electric or gas? And do you have a preference? It is a gas cooktop with an electric set of stoves. And I am a diehard, dyed in the wool gas stovetop person. I have an induction at home and I hate it. I, hate it. Mm -hmm. it. I tolerate it. Like it's pretty, it works. It's the only thing I'm allowed to have in my village house. I live like in a downtown medieval village. <laughs> I can't have gas. I'm on the second floor, um, but I miss it. 
I miss gas and I like cooking here because of the gas. So. Okay, I'm gonna take out my rest of my fennel and bench or my fennel and fruit. I'm also working through the Q and A questions because there's a bunch there. So one of the questions was, um, I had no official involvement in cooking food. How did I convince investors? To say I didn't have official involvement in cooking and food would be wildly inaccurate. I was also invested in a number of food and wine companies. Um, and I, I just wasn't professionally involved. And the people I reached out to were people who had known me for a really long time. Um, I am six foot one. That was a question that was asked is how tall I am. Um, no one lived in the house while Paul and Julia weren't here. It was used sometimes by friends of Simone, but no one lived in it full time. It was just kind of here. Hmm. Uh, do I use any of Julia Child's recipes? No. Never. So you haven't cooked through the book like the movie, right? No. <laughs> I've cooked a few of them. Uh, it, it's, it's like, it, I, I respect it so much. And it is built for an American grocery store in the 1960s and 70s, and I live in France. And so it doesn't really track the same way. Um, so that's a huge thing because the ingredients that it's called for and the type and the type of flowers and all of that, they don't transfer exactly to living in France. Mm -hmm. um, I used to cook a lot of her recipes when I lived in the States, um, mm -hmm. but I don't use any of them now. Like none of them are like my dyed in the wool go-tos. I literally, I never, I haven't cooked from a cookbook in two years. Mm -hmm. I, I use cookbooks as reference material. Like they're like, they're like my encyclopedias to my research projects. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions we have, McKenna, is you've mentioned a number of different projects you're working on, which the cookbook, cookbook is one of. Which ones are you enjoying the most right now? Um... I think right now the cookbook's the most fun. Um, it, it's like the, it's the joy project of the moment. It's something that is distracting from the reality of, I haven't had a guest, a significant guest in over a year. We had three weeks booked last summer by people who found us randomly on Airbnb. Um, but we've kind of, we're kind of closed, right? And so the cookbook has been really, really fun because it's brought a lot of joy back into the process of being and doing things. And it means I get to use my food photography and my styling skills, which I don't do very often. And that's something that I've trained in and I enjoy it. So it's like fun to be in that right now and also be creating something. Because normally I wouldn't be able to even take on a cookbook because we're too busy. It would be really challenging for us to write a seasonal cookbook when we have when we run cooking school season, guests arrive on Sunday, they leave on Friday, and then we turn over and start again. So, right. yeah. And you're just starting, a, a, is it a 12-week session, the, the OK Perfect um, online yeah. cooking session that you're, you and yeah. uh, Kendall are doing? Yes. So we have an online school that runs in sessions, and we just did our first kind of session launch. And that's been a lot of fun. That's a very different way of, of approaching like online cooking than we've done before. Before, which is kind of like haphazard. We did what we wanted to. And this time we really built this like rich, vibrant curriculum uh, to kind of go along with it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. We did have a fun comment that came in earlier that was, I would attend a class with McKenna even weekly, remotely. She's great. If she offered <laughs> is she offering great remote classes at this time? Will she if she's not? <laughs> the answer is yes. We have an online school. Um, and if you get on the lapeach.com mailing list, it's at the bottom. It says become a pachunicorn. That's what we call people who come to La Peach is pachunicorns. Um, we do remote classes that way. Um, and we will pop yeah. that into the, the chat and the Q&A boxes. Yeah. And we do six people a week at the cooking school. We can do 12. We've done 12 before. So just below us is three other houses owned by the Beck family. So Simone Beck's family still owns three properties on the domain. And there is another pegboard kitchen that is where they did a lot of the testing for mastering the art of French cooking too. And sometimes we were at that house also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Um, favorite cookbook authors. <sighs> No, I don't. Like, I have a ton that I, I'm interested in, but I, so I, and the other question that was kind of related to this is like going to the internet. So what I use the internet for is if I have something that comes up in my head, that is an ingredient pairing, I Google the ingredients literally, and then add recipe. And then I check to see if there's something else that's been made before that has those ingredients in it. And I check the reviews and that's how I use online things. Um, I really enjoy, uh, Erin Go Yoga's food photography. She's who I studied with. I think her work is beautiful. Um, I have been tearing through um, Melissa Clark's most recent cookbook because I think it's really beautiful as well. Um, and you know, I, I still always go to Simone's cookbooks, oftentimes first, and then I go to mastering when I'm kind of building my own things. Um, so I still look at Mastering the Art of French Cooking to like see if they did anything that's super interesting to me. But I spend a lot of time kind of like doing it like I would literally a research project, right? Going, you're all smithies, right? We pull material and then we write a paper on the subject. I kind of treat cooking the same way. Hmm. So I go to all these cookbooks to kind of create something and then I create it in a way that resonates with my personal taste buds better or what I have access to more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So the, a nice tie-in question. I am not a courageous cook, Lula asks. What advice does McKenna have for those of us who are cookbook dependent and become and become more, or to become, sorry, more uh, experienced? I can't say the word experimental. <laughs> experimental. Um, my biggest recommendation is start figuring out, like start dissecting dishes you eat at restaurants. What do you taste? What do you notice? Like, look at the meat you're eating. Is it seared? Is it not seared? Is it like truly medium rare? And do you really like it that way? Or do you prefer it more done? What sort of texture is the sauce like? Start actually trusting like what you enjoy and then start emulating that as best as you can. Like, and if you don't know how to do that intuitively, um, Samin Noserat's book is a great starting place, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. I adore her work. That was someone who asked if I have cookbook bloggers and uh, cookbook writers. I mean, I really love that cookbook from a place of the fact that it explains a lot about how to layer things and how to create things. And then also we have a method, we do webinars once a quarter where we talk literally through exactly how every single dish in the entire world, not an exaggeration, is delicious and why and you can apply our method to it. Um, we call it the okay perfect cooking method. And it's like, it helps you backtrack from dishes you already love and also create your own things. Great. So an interesting question about pastries. One, do you cook them? Do you make pastries? And do you use recipes to measure, estimate, guess? Because they are so, baking is such, so much about chemical reaction between the components. Right. Um, so I, I bake very little, um, very, very little. I'll be very clear. Baking and cooking aren't the same thing. Right. Right. Cooking mm -hmm. is a vastly different thing from baking. That's like saying chemistry and physics are the same or chemistry and biology are the same, right? They're all sciences. They're all things where we make food. Like, Baking is full on chemistry. Most cooking isn't. Cooking is art. And there are chemi chemical reactions happening, but you're way less likely to screw it up. And I think the fear of screwing it up often comes from baking instead of cooking. And then we kind of conflate the two. So anything that involves a leavening agent or like baking powder has a more baking end to it. And that is literally like you mess up by it. Mm -hmm. that much you might have a volcano instead of a cake and that's a little bit of an exaggeration right but um but I don't bake that much I bake a little bit of no need breads but also like I live in France why would I bake mm -hmm. <laughs> good. there's so much good baked goods that I don't have to spend 24 hours laboring over amazing we had a couple of questions I can, I can buy a croissant for a dollar 20 why would I make croissants yeah <laughs> A delicious flaky buttery croissant. 
Hmm. We've had um, a couple mm-hmm. of questions come in about how brown the um, roasted um, fennel and grapefruit should be um, and checking on that. Yeah, so I, I will show you. I have some that way over brown. Um, I really, I cook so rarely in the new kitchen. So I have, this oven is still not my friend. Um, you can see how inact, like this is, <laughs> how uh, inconsistent even a brand new French handmade oven is. Look at that, not mm. good. Look at that, great, right? Like I like that, I like that, I don't like that. That's actually the blood orange, not burned. I like this, like look at that, That's I don't want that. But I, I didn't really have a choice. I could have moved that individual piece, but like I didn't. Um, so all of that is fine, but like I have corners of my fennel that aren't so fine. But then you know the great thing about that is I can just cut, cut off the really crispy bits. And some people in my household really like crispy bits. Right. They enjoy the flavor. Um, so that hopefully answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Why? What other questions do we have? And then we'll construct the salad and then we'll answer all the cooking questions. Right. Let's see. Looking right. back through. There's another question about how do you recommend developing the courage to cook without recipes? What knowledge do you feel is helpful to, to learn this? Um, my cookbook will answer a lot of that. Yeah. Plug. It's not coming out for like a year or two. So it's not all that helpful. <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is, is that there's not a lot of really great material out there for teaching cooking. Um, and it's one of the issues that I have been having with like, recommending things to people. There's so much out there. It's like, just let me show you how I do a dish. The key things to understand are like, what makes food taste delicious? And what makes food taste delicious is skills like browning. Um, Carla Lally Music's cookbook is another really good one for this. It's called Where Cooking Begins. She literally shows you like 15 methods of cooking and then like 10 ingredients for each method. And that's a really great place to start because uh, it helps you. But what it comes down to is, again, thinking through things that sound good or adjacent so one of the questions I had in the comments that I kind of ignored was like, is it okay if uh, Carla Lolly music, where cooking begins. Um, one of the questions was like, is it, I just have oranges, is it fine? Yeah, it really doesn't matter. You could have just done oranges. You could also just do lemons. You could have done a mix of lemon, orange, and grapefruit. Like we could throw pomegranate in this salad, right? So what we're looking for is like, what am I diving into? And then like, what complements and contrasts all of that? And Amy was at my, Amy, who's one of our admin, or not admins, mods today. She was at uh, the OK Perfect webinar. And we like literally walk through a pyramid that explains all of this. But what it comes down to is understanding like the fundamental things that you enjoy and what makes food taste delicious to you. Because if I give you a recipe for a vinaigrette and you really like acid forward vinaigrettes and my vinaigrette recipe I hand you is acid forward and you pour it on a salad and you go, well, that's not interesting. You gotta kind of start understanding what your palate is first. It's more about what you enjoy eating than it is about cooking. And then it's just the skills of bringing that, bringing that like, how do I actually maneuver the food from food to pan to plate? in a way that matches my taste buds. Great. I've just pasted the, a link to the uh, Where Cooking Begins book into the chat. It's a good one. Hmm. Do you have a name for your cookbook and can we pre-order it? <laughs> question that came in. Morris, are you watching? We already have people want to pre-order. Um, <laughs> it has a working title. It, we're literally in proposal phase. Like I signed my contract this week. Like, this is just like, just starting. Um, I mean, but I've written like 75 pages. We're moving. Um, but right now it's called Pinch of Salt. Who knows if that's what it'll still be called. But that's what it's it, currently called. Will it be non-recipe based? Yeah. It'll be yeah, yeah, both. Yes. So it 
because it's a cookbook and the expectation is it has recipes and there are plenty of people who are nervous about it, there will be measurements in some things. And it'll say also, please just tell me to shove off if you want to do something different with this. <laughs> and here are six ideas you could do something different with this. Cool. So, I mean, I, I also want to make sure that people who are nervous about it, like can actually still access it and not just like re pick it up and put it down and go, it's not for me. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of trying to reach a broader audience of like how to talk about all of these things, like wherever you are on the spectrum, whether you're trying to be more creative and go off the book, or you're trying to like just get better at cooking recipes. So the reason why recipes are often hard for people who are struggling with cooking is because you're paying too much attention to the book and not enough attention to the food. So the food is burning or something's happening to it. Kind of like what happened with mine tonight. I was more paying attention to you all than my food, right? So my food is my secondary. When you are cooking from a recipe, you are focused so much on the recipe. You're not actually paying attention to the, sensor, the sensory things that are happening to food. You can listen to food. You can smell food. You can smell burning. But if your nose is in a book and you're going, what next? And did I get my tape, where's my, my tablespoon measure and my teaspoon measure, like you get lost. And that's what oftentimes goes awry is actually cooking from a book. It sounds counterintuitive, but it happens all the time. I mean, it happens to me the few times I'm like trying something new and I wanna make sure I'm following it exactly. I haven't done this for a really long time. It's been about two years, but the last time I did it, it was a cassoulet and I royally screwed it up because I was so like in the book. And I was trying to read ahead so I didn't get behind and like things are burning. There's six things happening and like I, it didn't work out very well. And so instead I kind of went back through all the books and then like actually looked at what was happening and kind of created my own method of doing it so that I could get it. I hope that's helpful. Also, it's getting really hot in here. I have to turn off my ovens. I'm like <laughs> dying over there. Delorean like, asks. So warm? <laughs> Delorean asks, um, but you do cook with wine, right? A la Julia? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have a foie gras sauce over here that I made right before this all started. <laughs> and it has white port and red port. And do you have, do you, um, when you're cooking with wine, do you... Do you seek inexpensive wines to cook with? Do you just grab something that's open? Do you, are you a wine snob or are you a wine um, lover <laughs> for cooking? <laughs> yes. I, I would say I'm an equal opportunity wine consumer. Um, Here you go. I enjoy really, really cheap rosé and I enjoy really, really fancy bottles of like cave age Sonoma first plurpity plurps that have been like dry farmed. Like I like it all. And I think they all have their place. And I think that um, the, the vast spectrum of the wine world and how grapes turn into wine is so delightful. And I am like, not, I am not married to a style of wine. I'm not married to even like, I put beef in rosé sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it tastes delicious. Mm -hmm. Is it traditional? No, I have a, I, and I, I would never have done that five years ago when I bought the property, but, um, I had, <laughs> I had a Bon Appetit food editor here who made a veal and olive dish with rosé because it was the only wine we had left at the time. It was a press trip and she made it. And I was like, they're putting rosé on veal. She's like, wine is wine. It really doesn't matter. It's just all like the sensibilities of French food. That doesn't mean it makes it taste better or um, less good. It's just like, is what's traditional. And so I started really trying to play with that. So yes, I cook with wine. No, I don't always do it the traditional way. I have cooked all sorts of meats and all sorts of colors and mm -hmm. it works out just fine. Great. And related, do you offer wine pairings with your guest meals? We do. Yes. Hard to pair though. Mm, we're recipe sure. free so the, the dishes come out <laughs> very different every week but yes we have we work with a wine cave in the village that I live in um who's she's a sommelier who used to own restaurants and now she's retired and owns a very sweet wine cave that's like could throw a stone from my house to it and so she has done her best she 
she like listened to me explain the cooking school over five hours and like explained like all the different iterations and she came up with some really amazing pairings and so every everything we do at the school is paired great um uh, McKenna someone has asked about the webinar and and the schedule of of your webinars if you want to send us the link we can plunk it in the in the chat or we can send it in the follow-up email yeah they just have to go to lapeach.com and sign up at the bottom and that'll get them into the loop okay. we send emails when they're coming out I don't even actually know when the next one will be it'll be May-ish okay great May-ish and then Somebody asked about if, uh, what would you suggest for a replacement for fennel? They asked if celery could be used. No, celery won't roast. If you don't like fennel, try it. And if you still don't like fennel, don't make this. You can just roast the fruit though and have like a citrus charred, a charred citrus. I wouldn't try to replace the fennel. I would just go around the fennel. Um, I know, Chez Panisse does all sorts of things I am perfectly incapable of doing. I haven't been able to get it to work. <laughs> I am not Alice Waters. <laughs> I am, <laughs> and I never will be. And much to my chagrin, they are they are uh, a very, very uniquely capable group of people. And they also have like 20 people working in the kitchen to try to figure out uh, various techniques. I am but there are but two chefs here. And so we don't have the same capacity to kind of break some of those things down. Your encouragement um, though is really important though about trying it because I'm yeah. I'm with you. I do not yeah. like anything anise, black licorice, um, fennel, but I do want to try this. I mean, with this encouragement, I know that like it's this, it's similar to roasting garlic. Like garlic is yeah. this very intense thing. And when you roast it, it becomes this mellow, creamy, sweet <laughs> thing. Entirely yeah, different. A totally different ball game. Mm. Um and you know, like it, here's the thing, like there's all sorts of things you could do instead of fennel, but it's not going to have the same effect because the, the brightness and acidiness of fennel is really unique. You could also do celeriac. You could roast the celery root, which would hold up much better than celery itself and be easier and wouldn't require as much like figuring out, but also Google roast celery and see if there's one that has good reviews and see if that, um, uh, works for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yep yeah and obviously we have a smithy who's a organic and biodynamic wine fan we're into mm -hmm. all that too i'm it's not i love i love all wines mm -hmm. we actually serve mostly organic and biodynamic wines in fact we serve um a hugely one of our uh side piece employees who's my chef's husband um my co-chef calling her my chef, but we, we just changed uh, chefs recently at the cooking school. So she's really my co-chef. Uh, her husband is a worked at a Michelin star restaurant with her as a um, uh, like trainee sommelier. And so we do a lot. Of, so he does a lot of our pairings too. So we do a lot of natural, like fully natural lines, which isn't my palate all the time, but it is a really interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So. We have a question about cooking for the holidays. Um, Marisa yes. asks, uh, you know, she says it makes sense to cook according to your own taste or the tastes of your family. But when it comes to holidays, how do you balance cooking for your taste with family members or guests at your tables at table and their tastes and expectations? And for example, what do you do if a family member hates the nutmeg that you just put in a quiche? <laughs> no, totally. So the answer is, my short, my short answer is kind of screw them. And my longer <laughs> answer is, so what I do with family meals is I make the whole meal. And if anybody is married to something that they want on the table, they make it and bring it. Mm -hmm. If they want their version of stuffing, they make it and bring it. They want their version of mac and cheese. They make it and bring it. Mm -hmm. My table, my choices. If you have, are married to something, bring it. And it's worked. What has ended up happening is that um, my dear husband's grandmother, who is in her 90s, she is well known for her mac and cheese. Well, she made mac and cheese last year. I also made mac and cheese. Oh, sorry, two years ago. I also made mac and cheese because I wanted to try something a little bit less classical. And she bit into my mac and cheese and she goes, this is better than mine. <laughs> That's a bummer. And then just like ate the largest serving ever. And she's like this tall. She's like this tiny woman. And like, 
And, and that's just kind of how I do it. You know, the truth of the matter is that like, there's always going to be someone disappointed um, and someone's not going to like someone. I have a two year old, something. I have a two year old and she dislikes almost everything I cook. Mm -hmm. So I, I keep bags of pre-made organic couscous for her when she doesn't like what I cook. Mm -hmm. That solves that problem. And, you know, I'm not really big into, uh, I don't, I cook for what's in season and less for what's going to make like everyone in the room happy. I'm cooking for like what I can find and what's the freshest and what's going to be the most interesting. Um, and then, I, you know, for super duper picky people, they sometimes don't like all my food, but they usually like something I make and I usually shock them. And that's always fun. Right. The person who's like, I only like my stuffing like this. I'm sure you all have those family members. Oftentimes they'll try something different and go, well, that's not terrible. And that's very empowering for your guests too, because when you are coming to the table of someone who is a professional chef, a teacher, it can probably be a little intimidating, intimidating, even though they know you well, but if they bring their piece to the meal, that's much more inclusive. Yeah. And there was a recommendation of endive. Endive is great roasted. That is another thing that you could do instead. Um, that would not be a problem by any stretch of the imagination. There was um, one question that came in earlier as well. What's most surprising about life abroad? What's most gratifying and frustrating? And then also, um, do you speak French? Yes, I speak pretty fluent kindergarten rapid fire French. My grammar is pretty atrocious, but I can have a conversation with anybody about anything. I just had my first business pitch in French and I did just fine. So I think I'm doing okay. They made fun of me a few times for how I explained things. Um, and I, was ex I was pitching a technology app to a bank tech accelerator and they still liked me. So I did okay. Um, so yes, I speak French, but I will tell you, like I make it made fun of a lot and I just speak it anyway. Uh, gratifying about living abroad. So, you know, I wouldn't say there's anything particularly gratifying about living abroad, except that I really like France. Um, I always wanted to live in France since I came here as a small child. And so now I've kind of like lived that dream and that's pretty cool. Um, I really like specifically the food culture in this region. So we're in a very, the Riviera is a very kind of like French Italian hybrid. In the before times, we were only 45 minutes away from the Italian border, right? I mean, we're still only 45 minutes away from the Italian border. I'm just not allowed to cross it. Um, but so that was really nice. And that was a really great thing about living in the area I live in. Um, you know, I, I will say that I, I missed most of the most recent presidency because I was here and that was great. Um, I, I was happy with that personally. Um, and the frustrating thing is that you never know if you can stay. Like until you get that like final 10 year permit, which takes five years and I'm not quite there yet. I'm very close. You never really know if you can stay. Uh, it's like every year you have to reapply. And that's really frustrating at times. And the bureaucracy is exhausting. Like I'm trying to get back to the States. I haven't been back to the States since January of last year. And like, we were planning on going in April and now we can't leave because our visa appointment to pick up our cart, which is already made, it's already ready for us, but we cannot pick it up until May 14th. Mm -hmm. Newsflash, that's in two months. <laughs> so that's super frustrating. We have um, a couple of people asking about, um, we can't see what you're doing. And if you're starting- Oh, I'm just, I'm just like throwing things on a plate. I'm gonna show you. I'm not doing anything special. I'm literally just pulling things off a plate and trying to make it pretty. Thanks. I will show you. <laughs> Nothing special is happening below the curtain. I'm just working through my fruit and deciding. Things for, about those, it. for those following along with the cooking, should they be? No, they don't need to start yet. Okay. I'll show you. Okay. And then we'll start it. I'm going to, I just, so I have time to explain it. I just started plating. Um, so I'm going to move to dressing the salad and then I will keep answering questions. Um, so this is what I just did. I was pulling off my prettier fruit, right? And I was just plating it. I'm not plating it particularly special today. I'm just plating it. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dress it. So there's already a little bit of 
a lot of bit of olive oil on there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to taste one of these fennel fronds. It's one of these little guys. I'm going to chop a small piece off and I'm going to see how the olive oil is doing. It has nice olive oil flavor. It is sweet. It is not too anisette -y. Here's your optional avocado if you feel like it. Um, I mentioned that. I'm going to dress this with sherry vinegar. You can also do lemon. I love sherry vinegar. Mm -hmm. my preference and go-to for some things. I think it's too overwhelming. And so you could do lemon, you could do sherry. You could do a little balsamic. It just wouldn't be very pretty. Um, you could do red, you could do white. All of it would work. I like sherry. And since I have a little bit of pork, so a richer alcohol in my steak sauce tonight, I'm going to do that. Would you ever and do then, white balsamic, McKenna? Yeah. Would you ever do white balsamic? Yeah, sure. That'd be delicious. Um, mine was in the oven about 35 minutes and one of my ovens was way hot and I, one of them wasn't because I have a static oven and I can, so my convection was super hot and the other one wasn't. So I'm just sprinkling a little bit of flaky-ish salt on the top. We'll talk about salts because that was a big question. Um, and then I'm going to think about seasoning. So I'm thinking about the best way to season and this is something that we talk all the time about is to take whatever you're trying to flavor. So in this case, it's a little bit of fennel and a little bit of citrus. You taste it together and go, hmm, what else can I do? Like I've taken a little bit of this and putting in a little bit of vinegar. So it's pretty vinegar forward. It's sweet. It's got a little bit of that kind of earthy, almost anisette, but it's not really anisette anymore because it's been taken care of. Um, I have a little bit of roastedness happening because of the char. And what I'm gonna do, I didn't plan this by the way, I'm literally just thinking through it and looking at my spices. I'm gonna throw a little bit of smoked paprika on because I wanna amplify that char and I wanna bring a little bit of spice to it. Uh, that would be like a nice compliment and a contrast with the smoke. If I had smoked salt, that would be another really nice thing. I have a little bit of sumac, which is a Turkish and Middle Eastern spice. And I'm going to throw a little bit of that on it. Uh, I don't know what else. Let's see. I'm going to throw a little bit of chili flake. I have a bunch of chili flake. I have silk chili. I have fermented herpa chili. I have... Uh, gunner salt gum chili. We'll talk a little bit about spices in a second. I'm going to put this black because it's, I like the color. It's this black Urfa chili. It's fermented. Okay. And then I'm going to give it a taste. So what I'm going to do so I don't ruin my salad is I'm going to pull a little bit where I can see all the flavors and then pull a little bit of the citrus from somewhere else. There was a question about, um, is it important to taste while you cook or can you just smell what you're cooking? Um, it depends. So in the case of some things I always taste, but that's really good. Cool, happy with that. Um, if I'm actually cooking, cooking, not just kind of throwing some things, like I wouldn't taste as I go with a salad. I would taste as I go with a soup. I would taste as I go with a braise. I would taste as I go with anything that's kind of in a pot. Pretty hard to taste as you go with this. I roasted some grapefruit and I roasted some fennel. Can't really taste while that's doing that. I tasted it after it roasted so I could start thinking about how I wanted to dress it, right? So like I'm tasting as I go, but I'm not like constantly tasting it. So uh, if you don't like the taste of olive oil, yeah. avocado oil is great. <laughs> that's a great you replacement. So well, you, you have the, the optional avocado. How would you, would you just place that and lay it over the top? How, what's, what's the plan for the avocado? So the plan for the avocado is, I can sometimes get really nice avocados here. So we're gonna see, this is the avocado that I'm gonna see if it's in good shape. It's always hard to tell with avocado. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to literally peel, peel the avocado skin off. like the perfect firm but ripe avocado which makes me really happy what i'm going to do is i'm going to chop it well not chop it slice it really really fine over the top um and kind of just 
to add a little extra yumminess. Um, I'm not even hundred percent sure it's going to work. It was an idea I had in my head that I was like, oh, that would be good with an avocado on it. So we're going to see, I'm not going to put it on yet. I'm going to taste it. So I have my avocado, it's a nice one. And I'm literally going to slice this as thin as my knife allows which is very thin because I've had a nice sharp knife. There was a question about knowing when your knives need to be sharpened. If you can't cut through a tomato with hardly any pressure, it needs to be sharpened. And I mean, that's like, my knives always need to be sharpened basically, right? I use them so often. Um, but, you know, a professional chef who's using their knife hours a day sharpens them once a week at least and uses what's called a honing steel, which is not a sharpener. The honing steel is, oh, come on, I have one. This is not a sharpener. This is a honing steel, not a sharpener. It helps, this is very, very scientific. It helps realign the molecules in the metal so that it helps hone the blade, but it doesn't actually sharpen it. it. In essence, makes it feel sharper, but it doesn't actually sharpen it. Fun facts you learn in culinary school. So I was thinking because of, of having some avocado just felt nice and fresh. We'll see. So avocado's good. I'm gonna take some of my fennel and citrus. Yeah, I like it. Literally it's So I like it because it, Everything is really roasted and I was looking for something to round it out so that it wasn't just like sweet and roasted. So I'm just gonna give it a swoop of olive oil to help give it some life. And then a tiny bit of this and then I'll top it with a little bit more of the seasoning. We have a question, McKenna, about how you organize and store your spices. I and that yeah. immediately make, takes me to the the thousand foot journey movie where there's yes. this wonderful sort of suitcase of spices. But how do you how do you organize your spices in the kitchen? So in the Lapeach kitchen, they're all on this wall, which I'll show you when we do the 365 tour. Um, at home, I keep them all in a drawer, alphabetical. Um, and I also have one of those magical suitcases. It's called a masala daba. It's an Indian uh, traditional spice container. And I have one from this great company called Diaspora. They're also who my towels are from. Uh, it's a, a queer woman owned, uh, woman of color owned business out of Oakland that sells direct from farmer to customer spices. That's just incredible. And uh, so I have one of those from them that I love that I bought for my husband and myself for Christmas. Um, so there you go, that's just, I added some green for color. Um, so that's how I organize my spices at home. And I have a lot of spices. I only use single origin spices anymore. I use two companies, three companies primarily. Um, to so many of you are East Coasters, there's Curio Spice out of Boston, which is C-U-R-I-O. And they actually have a brick and mortar. They're currently closed, but they have an online shop. And then I use Burlap and Barrel, which is out of New York. They're also single origin. Uh, which is great. And then I use Diaspora Co., which is the company I just mentioned. I used mostly, I used, I used one of each today. There you go. Okay, let me give you the quick tour of the kitchen. So there's the spices, right? And the pantry's over here. It's not very interesting right now. It's pretty empty, but... Just kind of got some pantry basics and some pastries from today. Um, then there's the back side of the pegboard. This is our, I literally used Master in the Art of French Cooking in Simone Beck's book as my uh, tripod for this today. And we've got our big, beautiful sunflower, our new apron stove. And then in this corner is kind of like the ancient tools of your. And then there's also this corner over here, which has a light hanging on it. So I can't give you a full look. Um, and then let me take you on back. I'll pull the picture off the wall of Julia in the kitchen. So the view of this picture is kind of like that. So I think you need to try to replicate that picture. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Love it. Okay. That's a salad me squaws in that photo. Mm. Yeah. So we had a couple questions about olive oil and um, yes. salt. Mm. And salt. So first one is if you don't like the taste of olive oil, which is common, that's fine. Any oil will do that you like the taste of. Like there's no rules to dressings. Like some people really hate the taste of olive oil in their vinaigrettes. Fine, don't use it. Some people really love the taste. Great, fine, use it. And that's one of the reasons why we're called, we're, we're recipe free too, is because if someone hates cilantro and I have a recipe that I'm teaching you that uses cilantro, then it's a huge bummer. We didn't put the fronds on the salad, but we should. Thank you, Kathleen. I knew I forgot something. Thank you for being my brain since I've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> fronds, why did I ask you to save your fronds? My apologies. Well, you can put them on your salad. There you go. It just adds a nice little freshness and it brings the original flavor back in. If you really dislike the anisette flavor, maybe don't. Probably why I forgot. Because <laughs> not my thing, right? Um, even though I was like, save your fronds, have pretty fronds. You want some fronds. So that actually brings in the avocado much better too, honestly. Mm, Look, lovely. that's much better. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Kathleen. Lovely. There's something to be said for a beautifully plated dish. Indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was also yeah. a question about, um, did you use extra virgin olive oil in the roasting? And people were wondering about um, a reason to not um, toss in a bowl with olive oil um, versus- An extra bowl? Yeah. <laughs> Who likes cleaning? Uh, right, it's, that's <laughs> the only reason. There's no reason you couldn't toss in a bowl. I, I cook a lot. I, I, I cook a lot, right? So I'm cooking for a cookbook. I'm cooking for blog content that we're working on for the blog that's launching. I'm cooking for a YouTube show that we're launching in like, I think three weeks. Um, I'm cooking for the weekly classes. Like I'm always trying to simplify how much dishes. So, and yay, Curio's open. Thank you for that info, man. You can pick up from Curio. So it's not, you can't go shop in there, but you can order online and pick up. So that's good to know. Great woman-owned company worth visiting. Not a smithy, but still great. Um, salt. Let's talk salt. Well, let me just finish olive oil. Good olive oil is hard to find. Make sure you find good olive oil. It should taste good. It should actually be made from olives. There's lots of research on there. I don't have any brand that I love except for Brightland olive oil in the U.S. And I, I find the California olive oil that you can buy at Costco fine. Um, we cook almost... I mean, 75% of our olive oil usage is from olive oil from our property. Lucky us. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, and salt. We're really big fans of using flair to sell. We're also obsessed with Maldon salt out of the UK. M-A-L-D-O-N. It's flaky salt. It's also great using, it's expensive, so it's only great for finished things. Otherwise, you're not really getting it. Um, and in general, when I, I miss salt from the States so much, you can get diamond crystal kosher salt. It is the best. You cannot give that, get that here. They don't sell kosher salt. Morton's is fine. Diamond is better. Diamond is more like not as salty in a way I like, um, but either works really well. And that's great salt for everything. It's not very expensive. And then having like one or two really good salts on hand is helpful. So like a Maldon, I love their smoked salt. There's also a salt that's from Wales that's really good that I just discovered. It was really tasty. Couldn't pronounce the name to save my life, but um, if people are interested, I can send it to the admins and they can add it to the email. Um, and I also love the like Sony Asia Camargue flair to sell. Mm. So, yeah. That's great. <laughs> I, I use whatever salt tastes good to you. Just really. fascinating. So someone has posted that both diamond and Maldon are cut with potato. I don't know how Maldon that. could be cut with potato, but if you say so, I believe you. Huh. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't make, 
Okay. As an anti-caking agent. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so someone asks if you use the tools in cookware on the pegs, and there was another question about how many of the, um, the uh, utensils and pots and everything are original to the house are Julia's. And I know you mentioned that in the beginning. Can you just um, mention that again, that you don't specifically say which ones were with the house? Right, so we don't tell you what's original. We had things stolen early on. Um, and um, there's plenty that's original, there's plenty that's not. And everything you see is basically the only cookware we cook with, except for some Le Creuset um, and some like bowls. Basically everything else is on the wall. So yes, we use everything that's on the pegboard. Can you show, Not show everyone the pegboard, but we use the pegboard stuff. Can you show everyone the pepper mill? Uh, yeah. Pepper mill with the drawer. Oh no, that's at my house right now. Oh, no. You have this is my house. But I have another, I have one here. This this is not the same one, but it's similar. Similar. But it's an old, old, old it's pepper wonderful. mill. And the pepper comes out. Oh, wonderful. My favorite one's at my house. I, I took it because we don't have guests. <laughs> someone's, asking if you, if someone's asking if you ever use smoked salt. Yes, I love smoked salt. I use Maldon smoked salt. That's the one I my go-to. I also have about seven or eight others at my house at any given time. Yeah, um, yeah I, I currently have 28 salts in my house, in my tiny village house, so. Mm -hmm. Variety. It is the spice cool. of life. <laughs> it is. I love salt. It's one of my favorite. It's a great book too. The book Salt. It's on the history of salt. Really, really interesting. So. Great. Okay. Yeah. So, hey, Lindsay, do you feel like we've gotten to most of the questions? Some are more, you know, sort of comments. Yeah, there's been there's been so much great oh, engagement. Amazing. And a lot of people who said. Thank you so much. We've really enjoyed this. And especially during the tour, there were so many wonderful comments that said how um, special it was. So I want to just reiterate that. That was that was really great. There was There's one question I see. Um, if you don't write down what you cook, then do you ever forget something that was really great? Mm -hmm. I write down things that were really great. And I forget things all the time. But then I come up with something else that's really great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then for the for the recipe today, for somebody who's, um, I think it was amateur, not chef who's not a master, full prep and plating of um, timing for today's dish. I'm guessing. So actual hands-on time, 10 minutes, about 45 to 50, including the roast in the oven. It's literally only 10 minutes, even if you're not an astute chef. If I had been making this and not talking, I would have been done in two minutes flat. Yeah. From, from chop to oven and then plate to finish would have been another minute, literally. And that's not an exaggeration. So. Okay. Seeing a lot of wonderful thank yous and compliments. Thank you all so much for these lovely words for McKenna. Yeah. There, someone asked if you'll get the recipe. The recipe was in the reminder email, but we will include it as well in the, um, the follow-up email. Not exactly the way that McKenna seasoned it, but some suggestions. Yeah. <clears throat> what we have is we have the recipe ingredients listed um, and the equipment. So I'll also add kind of um, the temperature for the roasting and, and that as well. And that you used um, a smoked paprika and sumac, right? Mm -hmm. And a fermented black chili. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. But the, and when I say the, literally, just taste it. Yeah. Try something and taste it. Like, I, try some of your dill if you want to and taste it. Try some oregano and taste it with it before you throw it on the whole thing. That works really well. So, so I did get one question about what restaurants I like in the States. Oh, that's um, so many. I miss, Fr I miss American restaurants more than almost anything else being in France. Like everyone's always like, oh, but the French food. It's like, yeah, and it's all the same. Most restaurants, unless you're going to a really high end, end restaurant are, sim set, are selling very similar takes on similar dishes. And once you've lived here for as long as I have, Gosh, I really just miss some American farm to table. Um, but 
like my one that I miss the most is Frasca Food and Wine and the whole Frasca Hospitality Group out of Boulder. Um, that's kind of where I came of age in food culture. Uh, I grew up kind of going there through college and then um, beyond. So that's kind of where I got a lot of my sensibilities of eating from. Um, and basically like I haven't been to a restaurant that I disliked in the United States that was a halfway decent restaurant. Like I miss American restaurants so much. And my other favorite chef is Renee Erickson um, out of Seattle. And I really love the gray out of Savannah. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just so many, there's just so many American restaurants I miss. I think that's the thing I miss the most living here. Yeah. And is that mostly because they are, uh, um, what what would be called American fair or fusion or what's what is it about them that the is... French start doing interesting thing with food unless you're at fancy restaurants hmm. I mean like in my village there are seven restaurants and like every night of the week there's a clams and linguine like I can make clams and linguine at home mm -hmm. I don't need to pay 22 euros for it and except in the really big cities, that's kind of just the fair is very standard French fair. And there's not a lot of interesting things happening. Now, there's plenty of restaurants doing interesting things. They're just not the norm. It's not like the typical bistro, right? And that's kind of what a lot of France is based on. And I, like, if I have one more endive walnut and blue cheese salad that wasn't roasted and just kind of like thrown together and then charged 14 euros for, I'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's, it's just that like the French way of eating is beautiful and it's pretty repetitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a comment from, um, a plug from Robin Silver, the current uh, president of the Smith Club of France. And uh, she just said she'd love to connect you and uh, connect with you if you'd like, so. Send me an email, <laughs> do another one of these webinars, especially a braise and cassoulet. <laughs> mm. I mean, we could maybe do cassoulet, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> Wonderful. So this was, this was so lovely. I want to thank everybody who joined us. We had over 600 Smithies on at one point. Um, I think it was like six, I don't know. 22, 622. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, it was really wonderful, a wonderful way to spend the first day of spring. And I see so many thank yous um, from everyone. There were so many wonderful comments and, and we just were really grateful for McKenna for taking the time, sharing her expertise and her talents with us and this special space, which I think um, is very much proven by the uh, turnout today. Yes, but, thank you so much for joining so us. And yeah, we'd love to have you anytime and please come and check out the free webinars we do. We always do them from the kitchen. So that's fun. And we appreciate you having me. Oh, and I would say Amy put a plug for this in the chat at one point, but if, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, follow McKenna because the photos are so lovely and you can keep up with everything that's going on at La Peach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, McKenna. This is just marvelous. You're welcome. And let me be clear too, like I know I'm kind of dismissive for those of you who are like a little bit more cookbook codependent. I'm doing that on purpose and here's why. One of my favorite things to say is that it often doesn't matter and that's actually true. And so I often just go, it doesn't matter. What do you want to do? It doesn't matter. How long? How hot is your oven? I don't mean to sound like a jerk, dismissive of your nervousness. It's that like, Whatever you do, as long as you pay attention to it, will work. Mm -hmm. And I kind of mean that. Like, even if it's not perfect, you'll learn something. So maybe you go, well, maybe I don't like the smoked paprika on the grapefruit. Okay, then don't do it next time. You overcooked. You saw mine. This is one of the reasons why, like, it's good for me to do the lessons in this kitchen versus my own kitchen. Some of my fruit didn't turn out, but some of it turned out beautifully, right? Like, that's all okay and all normal. You're not trying to be a Michelin restaurant, right? I mean, maybe some of you are. And if that's the case, I'm not the cooking teacher for you. <laughs> but in general, like, 
even when certain things don't turn out, other things will. And just like, trust your taste buds. You know what you like to eat better than anybody else. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your authentic style. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Some might call it harsh, but I like authentic. <laughs> said what a stellar educator well, so. thank you Sarah <laughs> I appreciate that I learned it from Smith I'm kidding no I mean I did a little bit but I, I also was a college professor for a while before I did this so I've, I've had my share fair share of like grumpy 18 year olds looking at me and I'm trying to teach them economics so <laughs> <laughs> much more fun to teach a bunch of smithies how to cook a grapefruit salad <laughs> <laughs> Great. I love this one. This is the cooking show that the world needs. <laughs> well, thank you, Ella, Alex. Uh, I, I hope someday that that is the case. Mm -hmm. I, I have big hopes. Hear that? Is Doris still on? Doris, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> when, so. All right. Well, we, we can um, give you back four minutes of your afternoon to go check out that spatchcock chicken. <laughs> And Lindsay, do you have some yes. wrap up remarks? Um, no, just a wonderful thank you and um, stay um, in touch with Smith. We'd love to see everybody at a future event as well. We have some wonderful um, presidential colloquiums coming up as well as webinars. So uh, keep an eye to the event calendar and um, a survey will be going out. So we'd love to hear your feedback to help um, inform our future programming. Yeah, so wonderful and have a wonderful day, everybody. Again, happy first day of spring. Um, and I hope you get to go enjoy a delicious grapefruit and fennel salad now. <laughs> <laughs>